And so today it is both a distinct honor and pleasure to welcome to the Southern Cameroon International Town Hall Ambassador Thibault Nash, uh, whom we're going to turn the floor over to. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you very, very much, uh, Excellency. And I have to congratulate you because in my long career, this is the first Cameroon related event, which is starting early, not even on time. <laughs> Given so many events I attended there, but thank you very much. My uh, introductory remarks are not going to be long because this is not like a, uh, a sermon at church. This is meant to be an exchange with the participants, not a, not a lecture. So Hello. Yeah. when I when I came back, no, just, it's okay. there's somebody in the background. Yes, I'm trying to. No, find we, I've already muted the person. Okay. When I came back to the government, U.S. government, as Assistant Secretary of State, obviously I found a number of very hot button issues on my desk, since the Assistant Secretary is responsible for 48 countries. One of those which had recently erupted was the case in Cameroon and the increasing brutality <clears throat> that the government was illustrating towards the uh, southern Cameroons, <clears throat> the Anglophone areas. As a matter of fact, my first week on the job, I had a telephone call with my uh, counterpart in Paris who was going off on vacation as all of the French do in August. And I, I told him, I said, we just had a very brief phone call. And I said, you know, the one thing I really want to talk to you about when you get back is, uh, the, is the problem in Cameroon. And he said, okay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, from that time until the time I left as assistant secretary, that was one of about three issues on which I was not able to make any headway at all because despite our best efforts, we just could not get, especially our French colleagues interested in joining with us because we felt that one of the instruments we should immediately create would be an international contact group of key uh, interlocutors who could involve themselves. Another huge disappointment for me was the African Union because I, uh, the, the person serving the African Union at the time in charge of their uh, conflict office was somebody I had worked with very closely. So, you know, we knew each other very well, but even with the African Union, I just could not get any real uh, interest or willingness to be very active. In. You know, we all know the reason why the African Union heads of state tend to uh, look after each other. They're not going to uh, intervene, especially when you have a head of state who's been serving for, what is it now, almost 40 years, which is about 30 years too long, but there was just no avenue there. So here we are. The situation keeps getting worse and worse and worse. The Cameroonian government shows no interest, no real interest in resolving the situation and, uh, and solving it in a way that it could still be solved. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I felt that the majority of Southern Cameroonians were still in favor of a honest federation, but as time went on, my perception, and I have not seen any polling, I know Cardinal Toomey uh, did some polling, but I felt like as the time goes on, more and more of the people on the ground are preferring independence. Now, I have to say from my own point of view, uh, and I, I say this over and over again, I personally have no preference for the solution. Uh, you know, I, I know that there are members of the community who absolutely want independence. There are other members who want a federation, other members who want a confederation. I have no preference as far as any solutions go. What I care about is 
ending the suffering of the people on the ground, um, coming up with some kind of a solution where the Southern Cameroonians have the same equality, the same rights and privileges, the same respect, the same dignity as other Cameroonians. So that, um, you know, that, that is my, my point of view on that. Um, I also believe, although I have not spoken to President Bia since I visited there several years ago, but I, I also believe that he's not going to take any action beyond what's happening right now. Uh, I know that he has advisors who are telling him that he should uh, engage in the peace process, but he has other advisors which are telling him that no, we need to increase the military effort and just crush the, uh, the secession. Um, another point that I have made over and over again is that it's going to be the Cameroonian community that's going to have to come up with the solution. That this is not an issue that the international community is going to solve for you. I know that's disappointing and I know so many members of the community have the list of grievances, including uh, the historical grievances going back to 1961 and various historical and academic points of view. And I tell people that uh, we need to de deal with reality, the way the world works, not the way we want the world to work. So those people who, you know, issue paper after paper that, you know, the international community needs to get active, the international community needs to solve this. I, I tell you, that is not going to be done. So it's going to be up to the Cameroonian community to be the, the key for any solution. I want to mention one other thing about the, um, the Swiss process. Uh, I have said before that uh, I, I don't have much faith in that process. Uh, I also know that the people involved in that on the Swiss side are very well intentioned. Uh, they have goodwill. They have put a lot of energy into it, but right now it's not going anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, the Cameroonian government can point to the Swiss process and say that if the opposition gets its act together, that we will engage with them in serious negotiations. I believe that at a minimum, the opposition needs to at least participate, even if we do not believe that that's going to lead anywhere, just to make the Cameroonian government uh, step up or shut up. Because as long as the opposition does not participate in the process, the Cameroonian government has what we call in the United States a fig leaf of, of legitimacy to say that they are ready to engage, but it's the other side that is not. So if the Swiss uh, organize a conference, then I believe that it's incumbent on the community to respond positively and at least participate instead of one group saying, oh, I'm not going to go if that other group goes, or at the last minute finding some excuse not to participate. Um, but as I said, honest to goodness, I, I, I'm not at all uh, optimistic that that will lead anywhere because I, as I said before, I don't believe the Cameroon government is acting in good faith. Now, uh, talking about solutions, um, what I have, what I have said and what I continue to believe is that the solution with the community lies in a couple of broad topics. Um, topic one, number one is unity. I know that there are various interim governments. There are various other groups, some favor uh, federation, constitutional reform, constitutionalist, confederation, independence, et cetera, et cetera. So I know that there cannot be 100% unity in approach, but I do believe that there could be 100% unity in the desired outcome for the benefit of the people on the ground. And if I was in the Cameroonian community, I would focus on finding 
those areas where there is agreement and focus on those and leave the modalities to later in the process. Because if you want to start getting a solution, then it's absolutely essential to act from a point of view of unity. So those people who do not want to see a solution cannot use your disunity to their advantage. So, so number one for me is unity. Number two is resources. I myself am a member of a diaspora, the Hungarian American diaspora, and I have seen how other diasporas can take their issues forward within the United States political system. And what it comes down to is resources, that members of the community have to be generous with their wallets and with their time and with their energy and with their dedication. Um, resources does not mean issuing 10 page manifestos or writing on Twitter or sending emails back and forth. Resources means um, actually financially supporting uh, your outreach effort and your education effort. And that's, that's the next category is outreach and education. For many of you, the issue of Southern Cameroons is your priority number one, two, three, four, five in life. And that's how it should be. But for America at large, the issue of the Cameroons does not even come up on the radar screen. You know, not only is it not a front burner issue, it is not a back burner issue. And quite frankly, I wonder if the pot is even on the stove. So it is your responsibility to make sure that those who are in political positions of power, whether it's in the executive branch or whether it's in the legislative branch or whether it's in your state governments, that they become aware of your issue. And that falls to you. I have seen other diasporas do this very, very well including uh, the Ethiopians, the Tigrayans, the Somalilanders, uh, and various others. So that is very much in your court, because again, no one is going to do that for you. Along with outreach and education, then there has to be a call to action. If you educate members of Congress, and members of the administration in the Department of State, in the National Security Council, um, in the White House, uh, what do you want them to do? Um, you know, that's the first question when I worked for uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and he would have a meeting or he would have a telephone call with, a, uh, with an African head of state or high ranking official, he would say, Tibor, what do you want out of this meeting? What is the U.S. interest in this meeting? If you get a meeting with a member of Congress and you talk to them for 15 minutes about the, um, the historical wrongs that were done to Anglophone Cameroon, that's not going to end up getting any action. When you engage with members of Congress, you engage with the NSC, you, you have to have an objective. What is the objective? What do you want them to do? Is it a, uh, is it a resolution? Is it a law? You know, what is it? And again, that has to come from your unity, because I'll tell you one thing, if, if, if um, the staff of the House Foreign Affairs Committee or the Senate Foreign Relations Committee receives delegation after delegation from Southern Cameroon and everyone comes in with a different story, then all they're gonna do is throw their hands up and maybe issue some statements uh, condemning the human rights violations, but it's not going to lead to anything. And in 10 years time, you'll be having this kind of a meeting with somebody else and discussing the same issues. So it has to be careful strategy, careful tactics, very thorough outreach and very targeted outreach, but it has to be a, an extremely professionally done 
public diplomacy campaign with American politicians and preferably uh, if you have similar organizations in the United Kingdom, uh, there as well, in Canada certainly, in Germany certainly, in Brussels with the European Union, and yes, with the French, because like it or not, whether you like the French or not, they have considerable influence in Cameroon. And I think it is quite clear that the French right now are not happy with what's going on in Cameroon. So it is up to you to engage with them and educate them as well, because you have to talk to everybody who has any kind of uh, pressure that can be applied in the situation. If you have people in Beijing, talk to the Chinese as well, because as we all know, the Chinese count for a lot in Africa these days. They probably, they, they, they very well might count for more than just about anybody else. So that's one thing, because your goal is to absolutely have some kind of an outcome through allies that will move the process forward and end the suffering and the human rights abuses and end up with a kind of Southern Cameroon political system that the majority of the population wants. Um, that it's where you will have to get into the difficulties of independence, federation, confederation, whatever. But it, it, that's, it's at that point where either the majority of the population will have their say, or the group that is the most action-oriented, uh, you know, will achieve their objectives. Again, I, I, I absolutely do not have any, <laughs> any say in that because that say comes from the Cameroonians, not, not from outsiders. But um, I would encourage those of you, uh, you know, who have a sense and interest in history to see how the American Revolution played out. Because in many respects, there are very close parallels. When the American Revolution started, the great majority of the colonists wanted to maintain their ties with England. But when England made mistake after mistake after mistake, the minority view in the revolution, which wanted independence, eventually prevailed. And that was the fault of England, not anything that happened on the American side. So, so again, I would, I would urge you to, to look at other historical models. So with that, um, I've gone on for, I wanted to do 15 minutes, I've gone over a little bit longer, but I will stop and I would be delighted um, to engage in discussions. And I will tell you, uh, you know, Anybody who comes up and, and, and starts talking about the historical grievances, um, it, I, I don't think that that's going to you know, make any difference whatsoever. Because as I've told you, um, it's not going to be the historical grievances that are going to carry your arguments. Uh, the strongest point you have in your favor are the horrible things that the Cameroonian government is doing to the people of Southern Cameroon. And, and, and that is what the world will carry about that must stop. Not to replay uh, what happened in 1961 and how that happened, because I'll be honest with you, again, dealing with today's world, uh, the people in policy positions just don't care about that. So with that, I will stop and then turn it over uh, to you guys. Much, Mr. Ambassador, that is quite a lot of information for us to take in. And I'm really hoping we were taking copious notes. Um, I know I was. So, and we have some questions. Please direct all your questions to the Secretariat and I'll read them out. Uh, we have several that have come in. This one is from uh, uh, Dr. Kilo. Uh, the, the Russia military agreement with Cameroon, what does that say to Southern Cameroonians? And let me go through, let me go through three or four together, then you can discuss can, them. Can, can, can I interject something here? It's a lot yes. easier for me to take them one at a time. Okay, and if that's you get fine. questions, what you could do is if some of the questions are similar, you can, you can paraphrase so that, you know, you put them together. But that's a lot okay. easier because, you know what, I'm 74 years old. So by the time you get to question number three, I've forgotten question number one. <laughs> Okay, certainly, certainly. So let's talk. Yeah, the, the Russian Russian agreement. 
It is what they have done basically is they have extended an agreement that they had in 2015. So it's not that much of a, of a new thing, but what really got me was again, the horrible judgment that the Cameroon government has in their timing, because they decided to, to, to sign, publicize this exactly when the whole world, well, most of the world was, a, was condemning or at least staying neutral in the case of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. So this basically is, it, it, it is kind of a big, uh, now I hate to use, I'm not gonna use an obscenity, but basically it's a poke in the eye of, of the United States. It's a poke in the eye of the Western Alliance. It's a poke in the eye of the European Union. And it's basically thumbing their nose. So uh, again, whoever advised uh, President Bia to agree to this was doing a, a disservice to, to Cameroon because it was a really stupid move. Okay. Um, something that seems to be quite prominent these days, um, and although rumors obviously keep appearing to be premature about the eminent uh, demise of the president, uh, of President Bia, which leads to several doomsday scenarios. Uh, in your expert opinion, you are, I think you've seen several of this play out in the African continent. What doomsday scenario do you see playing out for Cameroon in general and Southern Cameroonians specifically in their interest in this matter for the, I mean, we are all mortal. Uh, yeah. The eventual, whenever that happens, uh, uh, demise of the president. Yeah, well, he, he, here's the thing. When I was deputy ambassador in Yaoundé, um, 19, uh, I mean, 1987 to 1990, uh, no, 1990 to 1993, um, there were rumors that President Bia was dying of prostate cancer. Now it's 30 years later. And of course, uh, you know, given his age, of course, there are rumors like that. But I also understand that close members of his family have lived to be over 100. So I, I don't think that that's the kind of thing someone will, you know, should be banking on, focusing on. Although uh, I'm sure that you know, people are thinking about the whatever will be the post be a government. But we also know that uh, since there is no clearly designated number two, there obviously will be a uh, very intense uh, battle for supremacy. And we know that his advisors, like, like I said before, his advisors obviously disagree very strongly on what policy to follow vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Southern Cameroons. Uh, and so, you know, everybody will be curious to see, you know, who, who steps in, but, um, you know, if, from your point of view, I would think about that, but I would not base my strategic thinking on, on a post be a government because no one knows number one, when it will happen and no one knows what form that will take. You know, uh, I think one thing you can say is it could be the same. It could be a lot worse or it could be a lot better. So 360 degrees, right? Herman. Yes, thank you. Uh, my internet froze for a second there. So uh, Mr. Edmond and moderator, in case I freeze again, you can take over. Uh, okay. We have several countries that have kind of gone through similar paths, uh, some in terms of uh, colonial history, uh, some in terms of seeking independence. So we can think about South Sudan, Somalian, the Gambia, Zanzibar, together with Tanzania, Eritrea. When we look and we can, and that is just within the African continent, and then we can think about the ASEAN region yeah, uh, in Indonesia and several, some have failed, most have failed really. Uh, when we think about the independence movements and the histories, what one or two critical pieces of advice can you give Southern Cameroonians to say, given the history of independence movements, what can we do to separate ourselves from the pack at least those seeking independence such that this is a more successful and and let me use let me switch from the word independence please and uh, a liberation struggle because we don't also want to be a south sudan like situation where you can you, you know you gain independence but you end up in a conflict situation you want a freedom situation 
where the people are actually liberated. So what, what one or two critical things can we do at this junction of the struggle to ensure liberation of Southern Cameroonians, uh, eventual <laughs> timely liberation of Southern Cameroonians? Yeah, that, that, you know, that's an excellent question because uh, you said the same thing that I was thinking was that how many of those struggles ended up in successful states? And one of the, one of the key factors in liberation struggles is the truth that very rarely do good military leaders make good civilian leaders post-independence. You can look around the continent and count on just a couple of fingers where that was the case. The United States was extremely fortunate in having had George Washington, who was not only a brilliant military commander, but then he became uh, an even better statesman. But along with that, he had the uh, inner calling uh, to say that I will only do this for eight years and then I will step aside, even though the entire uh, country wanted him to stay. So that takes an extremely rare individual. You mentioned South Sudan, which is one of the biggest disasters. And one of the reasons I believe that it went in the wrong direction is because John Garang, who was a George Washington type of figure, unfortunately died uh, before uh, South Sudan you know, could take off. And then you look at the, yeah, the, the cases you mentioned, Eritrea, the same thing. You have a brilliant military commander who has been a, you know, horrible, horrible president because of his megalomania and unwillingness to step out of power. So it, 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 in the such cases, it is, it is worthwhile having good military people, but for them to understand that they are good military people and not necessarily post-independence leaders, uh, and it's good to have civilian post-independent leaders who can work together with the military leaders. Otherwise, you know, as I said in one of my congressional testimonies, because, um, you know, at that time I was very pessimistic about everything. I said, um, the world does not need a new, uh, you know, rump country that becomes a basket case of uh, misgovernment, of where the human rights violations would be even worse than they are now. So that's, that, that has to be very carefully considered by the community, but most importantly by the community on the ground, because, you know, the, the members, again, being a member of the Hungarian diaspora, we could sit in the United States and discuss these issues while going to Walmart, whereas the people on the ground <laughs> did not have that kind of a luxury. They were, and they're the ones who are really impacted by these decisions. And then you always have in a post independence scenario where the diaspora wants to come in and exercise a certain amount of power and the people on the ground say, go away. Where were you when we were doing the, the difficult things? You know, it's not for you to tell us how to run our country. So it's very important to, to have close coordination and cooperation throughout the whole process, if that is the direction that the people of Southern Cameroons want to go in. Herman. Okay, um, Herman, I have yeah, a question. question uh, on the Secretariat, in the Secretariat chat, which really probably very important for His Excellency okay. to pick up, right? The question about uh, the interim government, can the idea of an interim government for Southern Cameroons and the diaspora scare foreign governments from supporting the course? I guess the, we question, that question comes from uh, Thomas Funger signed up on his team. And then the second one, I know you said you were 74, but I see a 30 something year old man, not a 74 year old person that is talking to us. But I should I should just mention this particular one because you already mentioned it, which is the 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 concept uh, from uh, Mbese, Loya Mbese, I guess, Barista Mbese. The Swiss led initiative is certainly not perfect, but for now, is the only opening available. We did not be necessary for all Amazonians to, uh, you know, to engage and then improve on it. Um, the rest is a comment. So just wanted to make sure that those questions are read from the, uh, from the uh, chat room. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll go again on the Swiss thing. 
I, I, I know some of the people involved there and they, they have the absolute best intentions. They have put a lot of their own resources on the line. Unfortunately, you know, the Swiss, we, we see the example of the, the Red Cross, phenomenal organization, but they have the, the goodwill, but they don't have any, you know, political power or pressure that they can apply. Uh, for that, they would depend on other members of the international community, but it would make their case a lot easier if the entire um, uh, opposition community uh, and the Southern Cameroonian people on the ground involve themselves at least willingness to participate together, even if they disagree among each other, even very dramatically as to how they want, uh, you know, the, how they want this to play out. Because by not participating, uh, you know, I, I truly believe in this from my experience that 80% of life is showing up. Uh, if you don't show up, then you leave a vacuum. So even if you are not optimistic about the process, and I am not optimistic about the process, but I think it's absolutely essential to show up and to not, uh, not use the excuse of, oh, well, you know, another group is participating and I don't like them because, th because they're thinking differently. Uh, th th that's a terrible attitude to take, you know, so that's one. On the interim government, here's the problem. If there is one interim government that the great majority of the community recognizes, that is, that is a point of strength. If there are several interim governments and they all present themselves as an interim government, then that is a huge point of weakness and confusion. And the interna international interlocutors will look at that as just waste of time, number one, and a reason not to get involved. So that's why my first point in talking to this group was the importance of unity. If not unity of process, then unity of outcome. Because every single group in the diaspora and on the ground should be willing to walk into a, a foreign minister's office together and say, we all want the human rights violations to end. We want rights. We want them to have their linguistic dignity. We want them to have exactly the same um, access to justice, government services, education, school, you know, uh, hospitals that other Cameroonians are, uh, have. They are not getting that now, so we need your help for us to achieve that. Um, if, I, if I could yes, ask, a, yeah, I just had a follow up question because uh, Your Excellency. Uh, because uh, when the Swiss process was going on, there was the talk of uh, it hampers other genuine uh, uh, international players to come in because they would say the Swiss process is in place. Now, if we are feeding a process which you say wouldn't go anywhere, wouldn't that hamper other genuine players who can actually do something from coming onto the scene? Um. Not necessarily, because my thinking is that if the Swiss process is going to be shown to be a failure, then the faster that's done, the better. Otherwise, if it just keeps dragging out, dragging out, dragging out, and the Swiss try organizing one conference after another conference, and some people show up and other people don't show up, and some people show up to the next conference, then the Cameroonian government can keep saying, oh, you know, we're ready to engage, but uh, the opposition is not. If very quickly, you know, everybody gets together, uh, gets together with the Swiss, and then the Cameroon government is shown to be absolutely not acting in good faith, then you have a much stronger argument to take to the other members of the international community, the ones who really matter. The, the United States, the French, the, the Canadians, the British, the Germans, the European Union. Um, and I, I keep saying, that, you know, don't ignore the Chinese and say, we acted in good faith. 
we, we came, we participated, we were ready, but the Cameroonian government did not. So let's put, a, put this aside. It's an absolute charade. It needs to come to a stop and let's get serious. In other words, unite if it only to kill it. Yeah, <laughs> if, if it's to be killed, because you know, uh, su suppose you guys all show up and the government actually, uh, you know, it shows up and says that the people on the, on the other side who actually are counseling for serious negotiations and they show up and say, okay, you know, let, let's talk about this deal. So again, 80% of life is showing up. And so far, you know, people haven't shown up. No, uh, I think we, we could just uh, take one or two. I know we said we were going through the secretariat, uh, but I still see yeah. maybe some people. There is still a, another question that has come in. Uh, Okay. Three hands up, Arthur, but there is a big yes. question. Can I, so, sorry, uh, let me just chime in a second. Before we go to the hands, I know Jojo Ambazor sent the question that I still was trying to, to, to put together and uh, with Yas. It's about, it goes back to mutual trust, uh, um, both in terms of, and his question preface was your earlier comments about federation, which you've, I think you've clarified that you are agnostic as to which path we take. And his question had to do with how can we engage in any form of relationship with Cameroon where there is zero trust. But it also ties to uh, Dr. Kilo's question regarding France, is that France has essentially made no statement or in any way, uh, uh, acknowledge even the existence of this conflict. How do we get to even talking to them? Uh, those two questions kind of relate on dealing with uh, those two parties. Yeah, well, you know, um, it's very important that no matter who you talk to, you study what are their interests. You can't just assume that everybody's interest is to resolve the humanitarian issue. That is a, an interest, but what are their real national interests? And I can tell you from my personal experience that I know that France was tremendously frustrated with the Cameroonian government. I mean, I know that. I'm not going to go into diplomatic details, but I know that. Also, President Macron has just been reelected. So he has, um, you know, you know. Uh, point number three, the French have been having a really bad record in Africa, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Um, they, you know, they're on the back foot in the Central African Republic. They have been literally pitched out of Mali. So their, um, their uh, goals in the Sahel are not going forward. You know, all over the continent, uh, they're, they're not having the best of times right now. So if, if I was going to make a pitch to the French, I would, you know, make it on the basis of, you know, number one, if uh, Southern Cameroon does get its independence, if that's the direction it goes into, uh, it is prepared to be absolutely a friend to France. It will absolutely uh, respect all commercial agreements. We will be open uh, to French business. We will maintain a two language policy and we will continue to teach French in school, you know, and those kind of things. So it's, it's, it's critically important when the community sits down with the French, when it sits down with the English, when it sits down with the Canadians, um, you know, to, to, to do it from their interests not thinking again, I've seen this too many times and I just shake my head when someone comes in my office and talks about justice and equality and it's the international community's responsibility, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I just, I, inside, I just say to myself, oh, you know, what a foolish thing to do. If, if you want a master lesson in how to do this, watch how President Zelensky interacts with various international leaders. When he talks to the Israelis, he talks to them from the point of view of what's important to Israel. When he talks to the Americans, he talks about our great democratic system and how we support liberty around the world. Uh, you know, he, he does this so that he, 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 
establishes an immediate connection with the audience. The worst thing you can do is when you talk to somebody, you start out by wagging your finger and tell them what a terrible person they are for not you know, standing up for justice and for helping you solve your problem. At that point, they tune you out and all they can think about is when is this person going to leave my office so I can get on to the next one, okay? You know, that's why I said in, in your struggle, public diplomacy, education and outreach are the most important components. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I think I'll turn it to my colleague in the Secretariat, Dr. Fontaine. Turn it. <coughs> Is he there? Okay, while we're waiting for Dr. Fontaine, let's, let's hear what, uh, just straight to the questions, please. We don't want uh, any preambles. Uh, Comrade Charles Agbo, just your question, please. You're muted. Unmute you yourself. You have to unmute. I, I'm going to okay. give you permission okay. to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, um, for your um, uh, I mean, for your explanation. Now, you said that our issue is not currently in the radar, the political radar in the U.S. But the Senate resolution, that is 684, was passed. How can we make this work? And how do we know if it has worked? I'll use that no, no, no. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get resolutions, but is your goal a resolution or is your goal the welfare of the people of Southern Cameroon? In other words, you know, resolution can be a step in the right direction, but what do you really, really want the United States government to do? And how do you want that achieved? Um, as I said, the, you know, the Ethiopians, obviously everyone knows of the horrible conflict going on in Northern Ethiopia, and there's two very, you know, different points of view. And the communities have been extremely well organized interacting with Congress, getting actually both uh, a, uh, a, a, a law, legislation passed, both on the House side and the Senate side, that um, applies sanctions to different people. I think uh, you saw that uh, Congress actually, um, or the U.S. government, through pressure from Congress, removed Ethiopia or suspended Ethiopia's uh, AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act uh, steps. So the community has been uh, extremely efficient in applying uh, US government's pressure and in steering US government policy. And as I told you before, and I think this is extremely important for you guys to remember, especially with the United States, not necessarily with other countries, that the Bureau of African Affairs, as I said, covers 48 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you think of those 48 countries at any one moment, there's at least four or five major crises going on. So, you know, you, you think of, uh, okay, the Ethiopian, uh, the war, Somalia, uh, the new insurrection, uh, the terrorism in Mozambique, the ongoing conflict in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, terrorism in the Sahel, so, so there are these issues that, that literally take up all of the time. So to get your concerns front and center just takes a tremendous amount of work. But I can tell you, if, if you get Senator Risch or Senator Menendez interested and they start calling the State Department and they call the Secretary of State and they call the White House, then the White House gets interested. It's... It, it, it's a matter of knowing how to apply political pressure in the United States, because I'm assuming most of you are also U.S. citizens now. And, you know, being U.S. citizens, you have, I, I, I'm naturalized myself. I was not born here. But as U.S. citizens, once we become U.S. citizens, a naturalized U.S. citizen is just as good as a, a U.S. born U.S. citizen. So we have political rights and 
And when you organize people as to how they're going to vote, uh, they pay attention. For example, the Ethiopian community is taking credit for getting uh, Governor Youngkin elected in Virginia because they were so unhappy with the Biden administration's policies on Ethiopia that they switched their votes from the Democrats to the Republicans. And they say that it was their margin of votes which took you know, young can over the top. So, you know, when you are organized, when you are unified, then your votes really, really matter. That's why it's so critically important to speak with one voice. And again, I'll tell you, I did not see Cameroonian groups when I was assistant secretary because I had so many of them wanting to see me. And when I had to worry about what was going on in Ethiopia, I just did not have time to listen to one Cameroonian group after, after another. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, before we take the next hand, there's a very good question in the chat, which I would ask you uh, from Eve Talom. And the question is, during your, during your uh, tenure, what were the hurdles that prevented the US government from enforcing targeted sanctions uh, against BS government's uh, key officials? Don't you think sanct sanctioning those officials opens a pathway to productive dialogue. Yeah, I, th I think sanctions can be very important, but sanctions are also a two-edged sword because if you use them too often, then they lose their effectiveness. And there's still open debate on the overall effectiveness of even large-scale sanctions. I mean, you all know that we've had sanctions on Cuba now for go excuse me, going on like 60-some years and they have achieved absolutely nothing. Um, getting sanctions through the US government is an incredible bureaucratic process. And um, the US government agencies who apply sanctions say, okay, uh, this year, you know, ideally we can come up with X number of sanctions. So you in Africa, who are your top people? Uh, you can't automatically just have any unlimited number of, you know, you, you have the people from the DRC, you have people who are, you know, committing terrorist acts, uh, on and on and on, and then you have the, the people that are blocking democracy in Zimbabwe. So it's, it's like standing in a queue, and the places in the queue change all the time. It's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a, a, a queue in Lagos, Nigeria. If you've been to the airport there, you know how places change there all the time. Uh, so um, it, 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 sanctions are not a straightforward deal. People think that, you know, all of a sudden you say, oh, you know, the embassy says this is a despicable person. Uh, they're committing human rights violations. So we want them sanctioned. And two weeks later, uh, you know, they show up on a list. It is an extremely, extremely laborious and bureaucratic process. And it takes people who actually do the sanctions to be your champions. Because at the same time, someone is saying, oh, we need to, you know, uh, we need to sanction these via advisors or the president himself. Uh, and then you have other people say, oh, no, no, no. You know, our relations, that would totally ruin our relations. And then Cameroon would no longer cooperate on the counterterrorism effort or those kinds of things. So there are always many voices and many points of view. That's why, again, I keep going back to this. It is critically important for the community to stay engaged, to weigh in, and to weigh in together in a unified position. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, let's we take still a have question. Dr. Fontem. Let's. I think Dr. Fontem now can unmute, mm -hmm. so we don't forget him. Yes, Doc. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Your Excellency, um, we have, uh, a, th there is an issue that relates to the way the Cameroon government is using jihadists, jihadist militias to fight the Southern Cameroon's liberation forces. Uh, and with the specter of, the Boko, Har of Boko Haram still unresolved, should the use of these Islamists not be a source of concern to 
the international community and how can we leverage on that your thoughts of, of course it should absolutely anytime you introduce uh, extremism religious extremism that is a very very important issue to the u.s government also you know to the to, to everybody basically uh so that is the kind of thing where your interactions and exchanges with u.s government activities is critically important um, but it's also critically important on the Cameroon side to provide that kind of information and details to the U.S. Embassy, people at the U.S. Embassy, so that then the U.S. Embassy from Cameroon can also engage uh, with that information and provide that information to Washington from that side. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the Cameroon community should have regular contacts with the State Department. You know, not just, uh, you know, one group comes in and makes some points and another group comes in and makes some points, but, but, but you should have members of the community whose profession is public diplomacy, uh, communications, to be in regular contact with the, uh, the Cameroon desk officer at the State Department. Thank you. Uh, let's take the next hand, which is uh, Victorine. Uh, Victorine, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask uh, Your Excellency your question. Victorine, are you there? Okay, if we, okay, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Your Excellency, for um, um, taking this time with us. Um, I'm coming back as regarding to the Swiss um, because we met in Canada and I believe that was the meeting with them and um, other stakeholders, I can say um, almost all the stakeholders as concerning the struggle. And uh, uh, based on the fact, uh, what you presented to us concerning that, if we come together, eh, eh, we are expecting uh, to hear from, uh, from uh, the government of Cameroon. Uh, unfortunately, we met there. So I believe that meeting has been held and because I have been waiting to hear what they will say. And again, um, uh, 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 based on that fact that that meeting has been held and the government of Cameroon still proceeds in its genocidal action in our country, what do we do next? Uh, what I would do next is make sure, again, if, if the community is ready to fully engage with the Swiss, then get in touch with, with your Swiss contact and say, we are absolutely ready to go. Uh, just name the date, the sooner the better. Because, you know, if you do that, I mean, ideally, if the Swiss process, again, this is my, my personal belief, so I, I, I can't speak the truth, I don't think it's going to lead anywhere. But so the earlier that can be made clear, the better, because if the Swiss issue a report basically saying we're stopping the process uh, because while the, uh, the Cameroonian opposition is prepared to engage, the Cameroonian government is not. So that's the end of the process. At that point, you take away the fig leaf from the Cameroonian government. So it, to me, the important thing is to not just let it drag out to just either leave it on the table as a viable mechanism that may lead to something or take it off the table as quickly as possible, which would be in everybody's benefit. The only one who benefits from an eternal process right now is the Cameroonian government. I mean, I know it's very pleasant to go to Montreux and, and sit, sip you know, champagne at the hotel overlooking Lake Geneva but um, but that's not advancing the cause at all thank you your, thank you your excellency we have two more hands up um jojo your question let's just go to the question jojo unmute yourself thank you okay um thank you very much and uh, thank you again mr ambassador for coming um my i, I have the impression that if a fact-finding mission is sent down to cameroon it will make a lot of difference to alleviate the suffering of our people what do you think we can do to, to ensure that a fact finding mission is sent out to Cameroon to find out, yeah, to investigate but, atrocities being committed there? Well, you know, okay, on a fact finding mission, the important thing is obviously who is going to undertake the fact finding mission 
who do you get it behind it? Is it, um, is it the Commonwealth? I don't think that they would be willing to do it. Is it the Africa Union? No, they're not going to be willing to do it. So it would have to be some, it, it, two, two approaches. One, it would have to be a fact-finding mission that would also have the support of the Cameroon government. Or two, it would be a fact-finding mission by a very credible organization that would go in under the radar and produce a report. Uh, for example, you know, in Ethiopia, they have the, uh, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, which is actually uh, it paid for by the government, but it's very, very independent of the government. I don't believe that there is any such organization in Cameroon. I don't know for sure, but I just don't believe. So it would have to be extremely, extremely um, carefully planned because, because the obvious thing is you want the report to be received credibly by the entire international community. You don't want the kind of report that will then be you know, totally discredited and a waste of time. I go back to that very first a multi-party election in Cameroon. I think it was, I don't I forgot if it was 1991 or, or 1992, where um, National Democratic Institute, NDI came in and, and did the, uh, the report on the election. And anyone reading the, elect the, the report, even today it's online, it makes it clear that the election outcome is highly suspect, you know, highly suspect. And the, the, uh, all, the all the Western countries at least except for one country, which was the French, you know, gave that report extreme credibility. So fact-finding missions can be extremely powerful, but it's, it, it again comes down to how it's done and, and equally importantly, who it's done by. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Before we go to Pa Granot, I mistakenly lowered the hand of John 32. He was after Jojo. So let me give him that opportunity. That was a, a mistake. John 32, uh, I would give you then after that, we can go to Pa Granot. You can unmute yourself. Uh, if maybe, you are we not, just, maybe we should just go to Pagra and when he unmutes, then yeah, because you know, you know, guys, I have, uh, I have to stop here very shortly. Right. Uh, okay, we'll go to Pagra not then we'll go to Bernard, then we'll end. Please, I uh, make it quick, please, Pagra not. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, if Pagra not is not there, Bernard, can you unmute yourself? I'm there. I'm there. I'm okay, there, I'm there. Okay, go ahead. Your question. I'm there. John 32 is also there. Yeah, I'm there. Um, all, all right, Pagranot, hold on. Hold on. Let's go to John 32. John 32, go ahead. Yeah, please. I, I was trying to thank the, the ambassador and quickly go to my question I'm that uh, uh, how can uh, we use the special protective status that the American administration has given uh, to our refugees out here? Uh, to advance our cause, because by doing that, they are recognizing that we have uh, a genocide going on in our territory. How can yeah, we? How can we use that as an advantage to advance our cause? Okay, it's you know obviously you can make that one of your points, but remember, temporary protected status is is exactly what it says is temporary, and if you read the um, the decree on it, it's all of Cameroon, not just you know not just the Anglophone area because it also includes the people um, you know, who are from the north who would be victimized if they went back because of Boko Haram. But basically temporary protected status says that the conditions in the country, and at no point is there the word genocide, but it, 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 the conditions in the country are such that someone who is here, even if their visa expires, then if they are forced to go back, then they would be in danger you know, for a variety of reasons. So yes, it's absolutely a point to be used because it's a recognition by on the part of the United States government that conditions in Cameroon are such that they would endanger a Cameroonian who would have to go back. Okay, let's take John 32 quickly before our ex before your excellency leaves. John 32, oh, go ahead. John 32, what about so my, to pack John 32. Yeah, I'm the one who don't ask a question. John 32, I don't ask my question. Go to the next. Okay, so it's uh, can I come on? Yes. 
Yeah, Mr. Ambassador, I'm very, very happy. I have this opportunity to ask you this question, a question. Um, I know, Mr. Ambassador, you are the big deal for Amazonia. You are the big hit. Ask you, and please. we've met you again and again, and you've, we've seen you come to us. Now, we Amazonians, we have lost money on lawsuits, uh, two different American firms. We have wasted time and money for processes that are not working like the Swiss process. My question for you, Mr. Ambassador, I see you, you are the big hit. You are the man, you are our guy. Question, please. Right? Would you accept, can you accept, you know, if on, upon proper consultations with Amazonians on the background, we do the right thing that it takes? Because I know that you know the offices, you know the players in America, What's you know the calls, you have the telephone numbers, you have the contacts and everything. You are the heat. Would you accept if Amazonians maybe do some proper consultations with you in the background to do some... Um, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, so Mr. Bernard says he's from Ground Zero. So Ground Zero means he's from the Northwest and Southwest province. So yeah. Mr. Bernard, we, we welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Town Hall. Uh, Your Excellency, I greet you. I'm calling from Ground Zero, precisely in Nabakwa. Uh, I've listened to you talk. I have just one question for you, because you've said if we have to go into any meaningful negotiation, we must know what are the interests of each and every party to that negotiation. So I just want to ask, with your experience, are you willing to help uh, whoever comes up from the Amazonian side to give them guidelines on what are particular interests of each and every party based on your experience? Did, did anyone get the question? Yes. I think the, the question John, uh, Bernard was asking is, based on your experience, um, are you willing to help? Are you prepared to help every person who can come, any Amazonian who comes to you to help identify the interests of the different parties that might be relevant to the conversation based on uh, your uh, what you had explained um, Mr. Zelensky is doing, you know, identifying different people and, and uh, tailoring the, the, uh, the uh, ask to their okay, interest. Uh, you know, <clears throat> coming out of the job I come out of, I have certain limitations of what I can and cannot do. This is the kind of thing I can do, uh, you know, and I do this not just for, uh, for Southern Cameroonians, but I do this for various other groups as well. But I cannot do detailed kind of work that you would, for example, engage a... Uh, a Washington representative to do for you on a full-time basis. But you know, uh, as well as I do, that other groups do engage Washington representatives, and there's quite a few of those people around. So if the community decides to go in that direction, then, you know, absolutely the community, you know, should do that because there are some really, really good people that have fantastic uh, contacts with the U.S. government. But yeah, that's not something that I can do. I what I do is I do because of my passion and, uh, and because of how I feel for causes like this. And, and yours is one of the causes that I believe in very strongly. Thank you, Mr. Thank Ambassador. Um, I think we've taken you past two minutes past the allocated, allocated time you granted us. Uh, we apologize for that, but we really, really thank you for your graciousness. <laughs> Um, I will, I would put, uh, 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 I see Dr. Kilo is in the house. If you don't mind, I will give her the honor. If she's anywhere, she can turn on the camera uh, to maybe say a word on behalf of Southern Cameroonians uh, to thank you. Uh, if, 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 yeah, I, if, if, yeah, if I see where you are, I will spotlight you if you're there. I am here. <laughs> okay, welcome. Uh, okay, I'll add you to the spotlight and... Well, um, Ambassador, we've listened to you today, and I'm sure that this is a bigger crowd than has listened to you before, because the Southern Cameroons International Town Hall is truly uh, a, a much bigger uh, marketplace where everybody comes together to share ideas and to listen and be educated. Uh, so we thank you so much for the education that you've given us today, and we hope that 
uh, as usual, when we talk to our guests, uh, given the kind of quality of questions, which I'm very impressed with, we hope that um, you can come, you will come again and talk to us. So thank you very, very much on behalf of our community. Th thank you very much. And, you know, may God bless you and God bless Cameroon. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.